Good morning. That's very better. So today I'm going to talk uh, about uh, some of the soybean production management uh, aspects. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, I will have my uh, name on it just in a second if we can get it to the next. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the management uh, things I've been working on and I'm going to look at different uh, trials I've done in the past year. So the first thing I would like to talk about is some of the work I've been doing on uh, water management. I have a big trial site uh, near Fargo, the airport is indicated here in the red and in the box there in the center is where my trial plot is. It's a Fargo claim and I have had this uh, plot since about uh, 2008 and I've done many trials on it and on the picture you can see we have also some control boxes in that uh, field. The idea of the control box is to manage the water table and I'm going to show you a couple of slides of that. So over time we have uh, generated some nice uh, data and published a few papers, so I'm just going to give you some of the highlights today. So when you have the control box, I have it set up that I have uh, eight different units, and each unit is about an eighth of an acre, and in, within that acre I do various experiments. So in this particular slide, on the top you see where the tile box is open and it drains and on the bottom you see where I have it closed, where the water is standing and is not draining. So I'm going to compare over time some of those uh, different uh, uh, trial areas. So I'm going to show you uh, some of the data here and I'm going to explain it. The first on the top, it is, um, is it working? Try that one. Try this one. Okay. So on the top of the slide, you see that it says surface. That's the surface area. And then we have down on the left, it is how deep we are going. And the red line is the water table. And you see over time, the, uh, from the left to the right is time. You see that the water table went down last year. So my tile was actually located about three feet below the surface. So if you look at the line, the line was below the tile line, therefore, no water came out of the tile. Now I have here the two lines. The one line is indicating where there was tiles and the one where it not tiled. And the conclusion is it didn't make a difference last year because we were in a drought situation. The tile never ran. But what you also can see is that over time, in June, July, the water table dropped quite substantially. And the reason is that the crop is utilizing the moisture. So the green bars here is indicating the rainfall. So remember, last year was a drought, so we didn't get rain until late in the season. And if you look at the water table, it's only going to respond to the end of the season where the crop already has used, utilized a lot of water and the water table is slightly coming up. The main point, however, in this slide here is that the water table was below the tile that didn't run. So, when I was uh, planting it, it was dry, crop came up nice and green, we got some rain, and all of a sudden we had some iron chlorosis show up. So this, to remind you, iron chlorosis is a main issue. The scale that we are using at NPSU is from 1 to 5, 1 is green, 5 is dead. So pay attention to that uh, 2, 2 and a half, because in the next slide I'm going to use that scale. So here on this slide, on the scale is on the left, IDC, and the IDC is kind of the brown bar, and then the green bar is the tile, oh, sorry, yeah, the, the yield. So on the left, you see the no tile, and on the right, you see the tile. Now, first of all, if you look at the two brown bars, you see that the IDC score at the no tile was higher than on the tile. So why was it higher on the no tile? Well, as I mentioned, I installed the tile about in 2008 or so, so it was a uh, fargo clay, it's salty. Over time, we have some rain events washing the water through the profile. So we had less salt there, and salt is one of the factors that affects IEC. So we saw here on the node tile this residual or this effect from over time with the residual salt that stayed there compared to the tile where it was reduced. But what it did to yield is it increased the yield at the end of the day for the tile plot. So I told to you that tile never run, but still have a yield increase. So that is something to consider that we increase the 
you know, the capacity of the soil to produce if you happen to have a saltfish. Now, it is marginally salty. It is less than one uh, uh, on the scale if you look at egg fires. Now, here, in, as I mentioned, in each of the blocks of about uh, 0.8 acre, I have several experiments. So what I did here is I'm reporting the numbers of five experiments in the last year and the red is no tile, the green is tile. So in the presentations that I'm giving, the green is usually what I consider probable the highest yielding option. So when I talk later, the green is always what I think would have to be the highest. It's not always the case, but I presume that, uh, or I assume that the, the green is better. So I'm going to focus here on the last part where I put a circle, and I'm just kind of uh, summarizing it here. That on average last year, tile not running, I had an 11% increase in yield. Now you can say, well, that's kind of interesting to know that during the drought year, I actually had an out yielding situation. So one of the factors that I've learned that is affecting the, the response for tile is also the planting date. So I'm taking two years here, I'm looking at uh, 219 and 220, and the left two columns was early planted, and the right two columns was late planted. So even if you compare the tile results, when you planted later, the total yield was a little bit lower. But what I'm going to focus on is the first bar. I'm looking here at the tile, green, the no tile, red, and you can see the yield difference. And if you look at what in the percent, that was 28% difference. So if we can plant earlier, we have a higher yield potential, and therefore the difference between tile and no tile is higher. So, um, in many of the experiments that I've been doing, I had to wait till the no-tile was ready because otherwise I couldn't plant on the same day. So the data that I'm showing you here is actually not giving the most benefit to the tile because the tile I could have planted a few days earlier. So what you see here is 31 experiments from a long period of time, uh, from uh, 11 to 21, and again, there is a lot of data here, I'm going to summarize it. Look at where the circle is, I'm going to show you that in the next slide. So, some total of the 31 different experiments over a long period of time, including some dry years, some wet years, we saw a 6% increase. And that is kind of underestimating what the yield difference could be, as I showed you earlier, that if I could have planted earlier, this difference would have been larger. But this is over those 31 experiments. The main thing I want to show you here is tile does work. What yield increase do you get? It depends on the year, depends on the crop, depends on the experiment. So that is my tile research. I'm jumping now to another piece of research that I was doing, and that is looking at ridging. Here we have some raised beds or ridging, and I'm only going to give you some of the highlights. But again, a paper was published recently if you want to know more information about it. The highlight. Flatland is where the plants were planted just flat, and then comparing it with the richest six experiments. The first column is the plants per acre. So if you look at the flatland, the plants per acre was less than on the raised bed, simply because when there is excess moisture, not all of the plants make it, and you will get some stand reduction. And that translated also in a yield reduction. So the tile brought the plants out of that saturated zone, but could grow in the ridges and had a higher yield. So again, in this case, we had about 6.4% increase if you go to raised bed, comparing it to the flat land. The next uh, topic I want to talk about is uh, 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 kind of the highlights of a survey we did uh, co with my colleagues through uh, the soybean regions of the US, but I'm going to focus on the data from the northern region. So part of the idea behind this study was how come that we have a yield potential of a crop but in the farmer fields we're not realizing it. Which factors are contributing to a yield gap? So in this slide you can see the red bar. We are looking at number of 41 
bushel that was obtained in NDSU variety trials in North Dakota last year. The estimate of the statistical service for North Dakota was 25.5. So you can see what the farmers obtained in your fields compared to what the researchers obtained in their fields. There is a yield gap there. I said, okay, now there's a number of bushels. There is some room for improvement, right? Now, of course, we are pampering our research plots and we get good yields, but it shows what is potentially there. Now, to make it even more interesting is to look at the yield data for the whole of North Dakota over time. So you would say the same uh, in Northwest Minnesota, but here it, it goes from 1940 all the way to 2021. The, the dots are indicating on the left uh, the yield as reported by the statistical service. So you see there is a nice trend line, and if you look at the formula, we come to the conclusion that it's about a, a third of a bushel increase per year. So there are three main factors. One, genetics. Genetics has increased over time. Two, you have done an outstanding job. Management has increased. And the third one we can't do much about is the weather. That is where you see this variability in the dots. That is really driven a lot by weather conditions. So what is the yield potential if you now take away some of the weather effect? Now we're looking at irrigation. It is in oaks. Looking at the average yields at oaks uh, from uh, 2007 to last year. And you see there's a nice trend line there. And if you look at it, that would be a 0.8 bushel increase if we could control everywhere the water. So we're still working on that one. We can't do it yet, right? But that is a potential. But now if you look at the highest yielding in oaks, the highest yielding every year, and you put the trend line there, we even can increase, see the increase in 1.1 bushel. Now the management at Oaks was basically the same over the years. We had rainfall there by irrigation. So what I'm trying to show you here is that there is a high yield potential genetically. We hardly ever touched the yield potential of our soybeans in our region. So now we go back to the survey. Uh, I'm going to take some uh, data here from over a thousand fields and I'm going to uh, look at the yield as reported by those that were surveyed based on the planting date. So I put here all the dots together, on the bottom you see planting date from May 1 to May 31st and on the left again the bushels. A uh, trend line going downwards and if you look again at the formula, formula it would be roughly a third of a bushel per day between the 1st of May, uh, May to, to June. So basically what it says, if you can plant one day earlier, we would potentially have an increase in our yield. Now I'm kind of saying it carefully because I don't want you to go out and all of a sudden say, okay, I'm going to plant on the 1st of May and not looking at the weather and not looking at the conditions. I'm talking about if the conditions are right, and you can plant, and you don't plant, you're losing an opportunity. So, you know, trying to push if the conditions are right will give us a yield increase. Now, the other factor that we make decisions on is the maturity of the varieties. And this is data from last year. On the bottom, the maturity of the variety. It's a little bit south of here, but I can show you any data set. Uh, it has the same trend line. And if you have a later maturing variety, typically we see a yield increase in potential. So let's look at the big data set from over a thousand fields. The maturity is on the bottom from double O to 1.5, and you can see the yields of all those fields average out has an increase in yield. And if you translate that again, that would maybe be a seventh. Uh, 0.7 of a bushel increase for the majority increase of one tenth of a point. In other words, if you go from an 05 to an 06, we could expect a yield increase. Now, that 07 is kind of a ballpark uh, figure that depends on your actual variety and conditions. But it gives you the idea that yes, there is a yield potential there. The other question we were asking is, do you use seed treatment or not? 
And the green is indicating where farmers use the seed treatments, the red where there's no seed treatment, and there's an increase in the yield on average if you use the seed treatment. IDC had talked a bit about it before. This one is a little bit of a, a smaller data set, it's about 270 fields. And we asked, do you have IDC? What is your yield? And here you can see the green bar, no IDC compared to IDC. Now this is just giving you the idea that on large scale, if you average it out, there is a difference in yield when you have IDC, a lower yield. However, as you know, IDC is very patchy and not always easy to predict. What can you do about it? Main thing is variety. Within this uh, particular experiment, we also had a graduate student going to all the fields and trying to uh, estimate uh, uh, the plant population by actually counting. So we did a lot of the producers' fields, se uh, several also in Northwest Minnesota. Just as a summary, these are the plants that are counted, 142,000, that maximize the yield at about 43 bushels in that whole data set. So in other words, uh, for all the farmers, you see if you planted, uh, had fewer plants, the yields were a little bit lower, and maximized at, at 142,000. Now one of the things that we also did is to count the plants at the V1 growth state, and then we came back just uh, after the reproductive phase, and counted the plants again, and we came to the conclusion that we gave up some plants that die between the V1 stage and kind of towards the harvest. So if you look here at the numbers, it depended a little bit on the region, but it was in the 5, 6, even 9% difference of the plants that were established, but they didn't make it to yield. So also we have to realize that when you put seed in the ground, not all the seed makes it into a plant. So we have three things. You have the seeding rate, you have the difference there, and then you have, secondly, you have the plant established, which is about 10% difference. And then you have the final stand, which, as you can see here, is again, you know, 8% lower. So we did a, kind of a compilation of a lot of trials that we did. There is a, a kind of a booklet out that you can uh, search on the web. And what we did, we looked at 37 trials from 2008 to 19. And because there was different yield levels, what I did is I took the average of the yield of a trial and called it 100. Because like in Western North Dakota, the yields were a little bit lower than in Eastern. So they got all on a percent scale that is on the left. And then on the bottom is the seeding rate. So the seeding, uh, this is North Dakota trials, 37 trials, and we maximized the yield at the seeding rate of 169,000. Now again, I told you that not all seeds make it into a plant. You take about 10% out of there, what do you get? 150,000 established plants, which then the use, uh, use recommendation has been for many years. So we uh, were pretty close to what we have been uh, advising. Now, uh, row spacing is another decision that you make. You don't make it on a yearly basis, you have a piece of equipment. But the way to read this one is looking at the 37 trials on the left, again, is the yield in percent. On the bottom is the row spacing. And as you can see, the narrower row spacing had higher yields than the widest row spacing, and the ones that we used was 30%. So if you just go to the 30 row spacing, and you go back to the left, you can see that it's about 94% compared to 15 inch, where it is 102%. So you give up seven, eight percent yield just by the row spacing. Now, having done all this work uh, with the survey, now we want to verify some of those things in field experiments. So I've already talked about the planting date. So we have here a factorial with planting date. The second factor is maturity. We have two maturities, an 08 and an 05. And we have two seeding rates. Plant spacing, as I've already shown you, we give up too much yield with wide rows, so we just uh, use 12 inch row spacing. This is an example here, an ex uh, experiment at uh, Castleton, early planted, and next to it is late planted. So one of the things that is driving 
The productivity is the photosynthesis. So what I'm showing you here is over time the percent cover of the crop. So it starts out slowly growing and then it accelerates growth. And on the left you see the percent cover of the field. This was the early planted. The late planted is following the same pattern, but it is delayed. And if it is delayed, that means there was less photosynthetic material out there to intercept the sunlight. That is why we typically see that early planting has an advantage potentially in high yield. So what we did here is looking at the cover, it's a little bit hard to see. Cover on the bottom, yield on the left, and you see there's a trend line. Uh, based on some of the work that we've done for a few years, yes, there is a relationship between cover and yield. So I'm going to quickly give you some of the data points. So now here again, what I hope to be the best yielding is always in the green. What I hope that is not the best is in the red. So here it is looking at uh, uh, 21 experiments, uh, the early planting versus the late planting. And I'm going to summarize the last two bars. So the last two bars, the bottom line, earlier planting gave you 6.5% higher yield, which is confirming what we already found with the uh, grower survey. So that is what we uh, were hoping for and we saw. However, something that we uh, also did is looking at the stand. So here is the stand of the early planted 21 experiments and the late planted. And on the left, you can see the plants per acre. So early planting, which I hope to be the better yielding, actually had a lower stand. And why is that? Well, you planted two weeks earlier, so it was colder and fewer plants actually survived or seeds survived into the plants. However, I just showed you that although the plants were less, the yields were higher. So we have to kind of keep that in mind. One of the factors that uh, played a role in 2020 is was that we had a very early frost. So that has an effect on the, on the yield of the maturity, right? So now I'm looking at an 05 maturity and an 08 maturity. And actually, I'm looking at 2021 data. And I was hoping that uh, the green bar would be every time higher. But if you look at the three, the, the section on the uh, right with Castleton, you see that there was a difference in yield there. And actually, the early maturing in Castleton out here yielded late maturing. Why was that? Because the plant was running out of water. We remember it was dry. So the late maturing variety was still filling the grain. It hit that drought period and could not fill. But if you compare everything together, looking at the summary, uh, late maturing out yielded to early maturing, again by 6%, confirming what we also saw in the farmer uh, survey. As far as yield on seeding rate, we saw only a marginal increase if we planted early maturing, late maturing, and the, uh, the planting is average. But what we were interested in is the combination of those factors. So the combination here I'm going to explain to you. Each bar uh, in this graph uh, is representing one of the eight combinations. So if you look here at the left four graphs, all of them were the late maturing. So as a group, the late maturing out yielded the early. We saw that previously. The second thing is that if you look between the green and the red bar next to one another, you see that uh, the green bar out yielded the red bar, meaning that early in each case was high yielding. So if you look here now at the seeding rate, you can see the seeding rate on the left is the higher seeding rate was higher yielding than the lower seeding rate. So this was the combination, and which combination was out yielding everything else? Plant as early as possible, which makes sense. Plant with an adapted, fully mature cultivar when you plant early, and use the higher seeding rate. Now, why was I uh, kind of talking about the seeding rate? It was only 1%, but that was average over everything. But the yield potential for early planting is the highest, but we also had lower stands. So if you can increase your seeding rate, you probably are going to benefit more so in that early seeding because you're going to give up a little bit of stand due to the conditions, 
it makes up by the higher seeding rate, it has longer time to be in the field, you have a longer maturing there, so the time total of uh, photosynthesis is higher and we can probably maximize our yield. So those are a couple of the factors that we can consider. So the last part, part of the uh, discussion today, I want to uh, briefly talk about the variety trial openers. It is available at uh, the table, but you can also go to the web and do a search, Google search variety trials and DSU. You get to our main section, you go to the soybeans, click on there, and then you get to this particular site. You click on the top, and then you get uh, the, the booklet that I have here in my hand. So what do we have in the booklet are all the trials that were conducted in North Dakota, and in one of the beginning trials, we have an IDC score by variety, and those scores were done on fields where there was no IDC present. So all the varieties were put together, and we have the scores there. All the, the tables uh, will indicate yield, and some other factors like oil, protein, planting date, and it, hopefully it will be helpful for you to, to browse. Yeah, if you have any questions, I will be happy to try and answer them. One question at the back. I just have a quick question. I'm wondering um, if you are going to plant a, a shorter variety, can you get away with planting a little bit later, or is that still the same idea of plant earlier? It's going to be better no matter what. Yeah, so the question is about the maturity, and then saying, well, can you delay planting your early maturity? So, the, you know, I have to throw it back to you, said, you know, are we forced to play late, plant late or not? Because regardless of what variety you have, you select a variety, planting as early as possible will benefit you. If you are forced, you can't plant early, and now you have a choice between an early and a late maturing, at some point there is a, is a, a, sh a shift, like if you, in the end of the planting window and towards June, then actually the early maturing will out yield the late because now we are running into the frost potential. So it becomes more risky and our trials show that initially when you have a choice early or late maturing, pick the most adapted majority for your region. Are you getting very late in your planting season? Now you should start thinking about switching because that uh, late maturing may not have enough time on the clock. But in general, if you have two varieties and you're ready to plant, don't say, well, I have to plant this one early and that one late. Plant them all early. Any other question? Yes, please. Now, what's the best soil temperature to start planting? Uh, so what is the best soil temperature? That's a kind of an interesting question because, and I've demonstrated here in the past, if you put seed into the ground, the first 24 hours it will absorb moisture, right? So we're always talking about when it is too cold and it, you know, it absorbs the moisture when it is you know, 33 degrees, you can get some self-deficient issues. But regardless of uh, you know, when you put the seed in the soil, if there is liquid water, it will take up the water. So then, so that is the first start of you know the, the plant's development, but it won't start the cell division until we are above that 50 degrees. At what time? You know, during the time you know you have sunlight, no sunlight. So at certain parts of the day, you may have the 50 degree and other times of the day not. Let the plant decide. If you are looking at the forecast and the forecast is good, the seed can lay there a few days and not actually germinate, but then the conditions become right, it will germinate. But the critical phase is the first 24 hours after planting, that it needs to absorb that moisture at a reasonable temperature. All right, thank you for your attention. I will be around, so if you want to catch me uh, for some additional questions, I will be happy to answer.